chapter 2, the Christmas story, is one of several places in the Bible that you can we can read about the Christmas story. And uh, something uh, just uh, caught my attention this year um, uh, about the story that I thought we'd, uh, we'd delve into. I was reading a story about a preacher. Um, <clears throat> two preachers were talking. They, they were friends. And uh, one preacher said to the other preacher, uh, have you been uh, preaching on the second coming of Christ? Have you been preaching on the second coming of Christ? And he says, no, I, I just preach on the first coming of Christ. The, the, the birth, the death, burial, resurrection, and everything in between, all his preaching. And, and he never preached the, the second coming. Uh, uh, Advent, the, the, the second coming of Christ, and uh, he, he started to think about that and uh, wondered in his mind, uh, meditate on why his friend asked him that question. And uh, he, he, he got so convicted that he didn't speak on the second coming of Christ, only on the, uh, the first Advent, the first coming of Christ, um, that he resigned this church. That he he kept his he, he felt bad that he kept everybody in the dark about the second coming of Christ, um, uh, but his congregation begged him to stay and and said, you, you know we we we've been praying that you would speak on the second coming, and uh, and uh, he he stayed with the congregation stayed with them for a long time, and and the Lord uh, filled him with the knowledge of the second coming. But this is a celebration of the first coming of Christ. This is a celebration of Christ coming the first time into the world, uh, very subtly, very uh, peacefully. And uh, the second coming we know, and, and those of you who have been un sitting under my teaching, we, we have dealt with it quite a bit and, and a lot and know that it's not going to be a peaceful occurrence when the Lord comes back the second time. Um but uh, chapter 2 in the book of Luke, uh, Luke gives us the, the most detail. Matthew is the other book that gives us some detail. It's interesting in the book of Luke, uh, Gabriel, the angel, speaks to Mary. In the book of Matthew, um, the angel, uh, we're not told if it's Gabriel or not, but the angel speaks to Joseph. And, and we don't uh, see that, uh, that the angel is speaking to um, Mary at all in the book of Matthew. But here, here's a, an, an event that, um, that the Lord used to bring about uh, a prophecy in the scriptures. And, and so it, it just interest, piqued my interest as I was preparing and thinking about a Christmas message. It says, it, And it came to pass in those days, verse 1, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this tax, taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, we have two ladies that, that are with child right now here sitting in this congregation. Maybe more, but I know of two. <laughs> And uh, um, uh, and we fathers, we dads, um, you know, we 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 
our concern of our well, wife's welfare and health and, uh, you know, we bend over backwards and we get them the pickles and the, you know, the whatever, you know, the wasabi, the, uh, the, the shrimp, the sushi, the uh, hot tamales, whatever they want to eat, we bend over backwards. We, we want to take care of our wife, especially as they are uh, w with child. And uh, when my wife was great with child, and it was getting close to bringing that child into the world, there would be no way I would want to move from one location to another especially in those days, and, and Mary, she lived in Nazareth. That's where she, uh, the, the Holy Spirit came upon her, and the, whole, the, 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 the seed of God was implanted in her, and she uh, conceived. Um, Nazareth was her hometown. That's where her family was. That's where her mom was. That's where I'm expecting... And she was expecting that that's where she was going to give birth because everybody was close nearby. Now, you ladies, you wouldn't want to be very far from a hospital, would you, when you were with child, right? You, the hospital, the doctor, uh, if you used a midwife, uh, you want them to be within reach, the phone call away, at the house when you give that call at 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? Been there, okay? Been there um, three times. And, uh, uh, and, and I started thinking, this is an interesting event that took place here. I, I would have looked for a tax exemption. <laughs> I would have said, hey, Caesar, I need an exemption. I, 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 can I sign up here in Nazareth? I'm not going to truck my wife down from Nazareth down into Bethlehem. Now, why did, why did Joseph and go and he brought his espoused wife, uh, his, uh, Mary, that they, they were uh, espoused to be uh, married? Why did they go down to Bethlehem. Well, at first it was commanded that they had to. That there was a commandment by Caesar Augustus. And, uh, uh, but because in that day and age, they had to register for this, uh, it was a census and a taxing, he had to go back to his family, family lineage. He was, his ancestor was King David. The city of David was Bethlehem. And so he had to go back there. I, who knows if it was voluntarily or if it was mandated that he had to go back there. Uh, scholars have, have tried to figure that out. What was the reasoning behind him going back there? Um, the, uh, uh, the the Bible says in the scripture. Now this was to fulfill a prophecy. Let me just go Micah five two. It says, "But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel." whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That was a prophecy 700 years old. 700 years old that was given to Israel that the ruler, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man would come out of Bethlehem. The birth of that baby would be in Bethlehem. 700 years earlier, 
by the prophet Micah. Now, there's another passage, very interesting, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. God had Caesar Augustus's heart in his hand, and he turned his heart to cause this prophecy to be fulfilled. He, Caesar Augustus had no idea why he, that the timing of this. God put it in his mind to have this taxing of Israel. And, and Cyrenius was a governor of Syria. And, and to understand back 200, 2,000 years ago that Rome occupied Syria, it occupied Asia Minor, it occupied Israel, it occupied Rome, it occupied Greece. And the, the, because before Rome and, and the Romans' occupation and, and stronghold and dominance over those nations, what was the nation before that that dominated those areas? It was Greece, Alexander the Great. So Greek was a common language there in, with those people. A lot of people spoke Greek. Our New Testament was written in Greek, not Latin, written in Greek. And, uh, and, and so uh, Cyrenius is a king. Archaeologists and, and uh, historians have discovered he was a king. That is his Greek name, his... his um, uh, Latin name would be Publicis. I'll just say his last name, okay? Caranius. Caranius was his last name. A and so a lot of your history books will talk about Caranius. He was a general. He was a governor. He was what they called a uh, consul, C-O-N-S-U-L, of that region. And... Uh, uh, and so there's been disputes with historians and, and uh, uh, archaeologists. Did this event really happen? And they're not able to find exact records. But there are historians that have, have written that there were censuses and there was, was this taxation. They have found records in Egypt that these events have taken place. And in Egypt, it said they took a census every 14 years. When do we take a census? Every 10 years in our country, right? Every 14 years, they would take a census. And so uh, th these events took place. A professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, Harold... Honer, Dr. Harold Honer, was, uh, has summarized some of the challenges that face uh, the historical accuracy of Luke's account. But he wrote that uh, Luke was a first-rate historian, one who writes historical works of the highest order in which a writer commands excellent means of knowledge, either through personal acquaintances or through access to original authorities, and brings to the treatment of his subject genius, literary skill, and a sympathetic historical uh, insight into human character and the movement of events. Such an author seizes the critical events concentrates the reader's attention on them by giving them fuller treatment. So Dr. Luke, as he was writing to Theophilus, indicates this event took place. It was important enough to warrant the attention of the gospel and to be put into the gospel. Uh, our world today... We live by a daytimer, okay? We live by a calendar. Uh, we have 
now that our daytimer is on our phone, but we have everything. We know who, when's each person's birthday and each event, and uh, we we can document it down to the the year, the week, the month, the day. Back then, they didn't use calendars the way we did. They didn't have a daytime. They would reference time based upon some victory of battle, some victory in war, and uh, or some major event. And so what we need to realize is the Bible is the word of God. It is accurate. Not the archaeologists, not the historians. They're 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 they try to justify the Bible by their research. They need to justify their research by the Bible. And, uh, and so there's all this debate, debating that goes on. But it's a major event. And uh, uh, that, that Joseph felt it was important enough, even though his wife was with child, uh, great with child, and... What's interesting is, well, you would think David or, or Joseph would have some family in Bethlehem. But no, they went to an inn. There was no room in the inn. And she had to give birth to this child in a manger. Now, my children were born by midwife. And Kim was getting pretty good at it by the third child. And the I called the midwife in the middle of the night and said, uh, I think you need to be here. And uh, she said, you know, what, what's the, the di gap between uh, the, the uh, what is it? contraction and uh, she said you may be delivering the child before I get there and and I'm telling you sweat was pouring down my face and I said get in the car and get here as fast as you can because <laughs> I didn't want to bring bring do that I didn't want to be a part of that I wanted to <laughs> I wanted the midwife to be a part of that. And, but, I, Joseph had to be there to have to help Mary. There was no midwife with them. There's no indication there was. But she, it just says she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and put him, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in an inn. Just amazing, amazing, an amazing event. The birth of our Savior. God provided her protection. The, the, the providence of God was upon them, and uh, God's hand was upon them about bringing that child into the world. There was no fear. There was no uh, in, uh, reluctancy to go there. There's no indication. He just picked up. And why? Because Caesar Augustus's heart was in the hands of God, and God was going to fulfill that prophecy however he so chose. And he drew them out of Nazareth and brought them into Bethlehem. And the baby was born in that major. Verse 8. And then there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. 
Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. God did not reveal the birth of his son to the affluent, to the Caesar Augustus, to Herod, to Pilate, to the Sadducees and the uh, Pharisees, the religious crowd. It was to the least esteemed in the community, the shepherds that were abiding in their fields. They were, and, and shepherds were not admired, admired, uh, uh, admired at all. They they were they were they were considered third class citizens, even in Israel. Because their king, earlier king, David, wasn't even considered by his father to be the possible be possibly anointed by Samuel to be king. He was a little kid shepherding the sheep out in the field, and dad didn't even bother to call him in to see if Samuel was he was to be king. And, and he had a whole bunch of brothers. And God said, no, no, to, to each time to, to Samuel. Nope, he's not king, he's not king, he's not king. All the boys, Samuel thought, of Jesse were standing in front of him. And, and God says no to all of them. And he looks at Jesse and he says, Jesse, is there a, do you have another son? Oh, yeah, the kid out there in the field, uh, He's the shepherd out there, the little boy out there in the field. Least esteemed, least admired by, by the people. But God chose to tell the shepherds because they were, key word, watching. Watching over the flock by night. That's what our job is as a pastor. It is to watch over the flock by night, the spiritual night, the spiritual darkness. In, we're, we're to reveal and watch for the second coming of the Lord. The, we, we congregation, we, the flock of God, we're, we're to be watching. And, and uh, we are the angels. In the book of Revelation, when the Bible talks about talking to the angel of the church, at Laodicea or the angel of the church at Smyrna, that angel is talking to the pastor to be watching, to be watching. And these shepherds were watching. And they were the only ones. All of Israel was asleep. When the wise men came, you read about, read about that in the book of Matthew. Nobody was looking for him. There was a star showing where he was at. And some wise men from the east came and they were able to interpret that, that that had to be the star of David. That, that had to be uh, the star of Israel. That had to be the star for the Messiah, the son of David, the son of God. Three wise men and nobody else in Israel. Why? Because they weren't watching. They weren't praying. They weren't looking for him. Can the same situation occur 2,000 years later with the church? Not watching? Not praying for him? That's what made that preacher so upset. Because he was just preaching about the past events that were taking place, the, the first advent, and not watching for the second coming of the Lord. And his life radically changed. Look at the word suddenly. 
Look at that word suddenly. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will towards men. You know, there are several events in the scriptures that take place suddenly. Suddenly. One of them was the flood that came upon the whole world. Noah and his family was, Noah was preaching for a hundred years. There's rain coming. There's a flood coming. Eight people plus the animals that were saved on the, on the, on the ark. Because God got them on board and closed the door behind them. And then suddenly the fountains of the deep opened up and the rain descended and the people perished that were on the earth at that time. And everything that was living that was not in the ark. Suddenly, another sudden event was Sodom and Gomorrah. Suddenly. God rained fire and brimstone upon those cities. It occurred, it occurred suddenly. Here we have the angels. Suddenly, there was a multitude of angels in the heavens. Can you imagine what those shepherds saw? And, and, and they went abroad to share what they had seen that night. The babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, the angels and the proclamation that was made by those angels and shared it with others. There's another sudden event coming. Another sudden event is coming. It's ha going to happen in a two-stage event. First, the rapture is going to be sudden. All ten virgins are asleep, but five were wise and had oil in their lamp. Five were foolish. And suddenly there was the voice of the uh, bridegroom that only called five of those virgins to him. The others were not listening. They were not, they did not hear. And then the final stage will be when Christ comes to the earth. Suddenly, this, the clouds will open up and he will descend on a great white horse with his army of saints to battle Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet at the battle of Armageddon. Suddenly. We rejoice that Christ came into the world. The Bible tells us that he, 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 uh, he came down from his throne. Think about that. He came down from his throne. He descended, the Bible says, lower than the angel. He became a man. Let me find you this quote, if I can find it here. Yep, by uh, Adolf Saffer. Saffir, S-A-P-H-I-R. He was a Presbyterian missionary to the Jews. He was a converted Jew. He was born in Budapest, uh, Hungary. And he was a converted Jew in a Presbyterian ministry, uh, uh, missionary to the Jews. Listen to what he says here. Jesus became man to remain man forevermore. That position he had at the throne of God before he came into that manger and before he, he, he was supplanted in the womb of Mary, he, was, he did not have the image, the human image of man. And he had this majestic position in heaven with the Father. But he descended himself. Jesus became man to remain man forevermore. 
And when Jesus was living on earth, his great object, the great task set, set before him was to get back again where he was before. He had left his position never again to have it as he had before. Never again to divest himself of his humanity. He had, as it were, cut off the bridge behind him by identifying himself with our nature, with all our load of sin on the cross. Because he died and rose again, he could take his place on high as the firstborn of many brethren, as the Savior of his people. Jesus knew that through suffering alone could he get back again into that glory which he had with the Father before the world was. But he will always, always and forevermore bear those scars. Nail-pierced hands, the spear that was run into his side, and his feet pierced. Those scars forever, evermore. He will bear those before mankind. And he will rule and reign on a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity. Amen? And we will be with him there. He will not sit at the right hand of the Father in eternity. He will sit on his throne in the new heaven, on the new earth that God will create as we read in Revelation 22. That's exciting. I, I mean, we, we, we need to proclaim those things. Proclaim that he is coming again. And, and if, if I, the, my ministry is we need to emphasize, we need to be watching. The church needs to be watching because it's going to happen suddenly. Suddenly it's going to happen. And if we're not ready, we will grieve tremendously, mourn tremendously, wailing and gnashing of teeth. The church needs to be ready. So as we reflect about Christmas, reflect about the Lord Jesus Christ, have a Merry Christmas. Enjoy your time with family and friends. Um, the, the commercialization of uh, Christmas, uh, we, we uh, tend to not be pleased with, but... It, we need to remember to put Christ in Christmas, tell people about his first coming, but that he's coming again, and that we don't need to be asleep like all of Israel was asleep. We need to be alert and ready for that sudden event. Are you ready? Are you, are you ready? Are you ready? Get ready. If you're not ready, get ready. Get excited about the Lord. Get excited about His Word. Be ready for His return. There's 27 books in the New Testament that tell you how to get ready. Okay? You got ready this morning to come to church. You looked in a mirror, didn't you? I, <laughs> I, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. You looked in a mirror this morning. You... you Men, you shaved, you trimmed the beard, you combed your hair. Ladies, you did the same and put the makeup on. You got ready to come to church. Get ready to go home with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Get ready. Look in the mirror, the Holy Bible, the mirror of God. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I thank you for each person here. I thank you for... Uh, the, the Christmas time, I thank you for the reflection of Christ. Lord, uh, think of all the years growing up, I didn't hear this, this message uh, of Christ coming into the world uh, and, and the importance of it. Lord, uh, it, it was uh, very superficial. It had no bearing. It had no uh, uh, emphasis in my life. It, it had no uh, focus. And Lord, I pray that each one of us here would focus upon the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing that he came uh, to preach to us 
uh, and then, Lord, to bear our sins upon the cross. He was he died, crucified, buried, shed his blood, but he rose on the third day, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he is involved in our affairs each and every day. I pray, Lord, you would uh, we would meditate upon those things. I thank you for each person here. I pray your richest blessings upon their lives. I pray that you would draw them near to you, Lord. Help them to desire you with all their hearts. And Lord, uh, there's a lot of distractions in our day to put us asleep and to keep us not watching and not waking. Lord, I think of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying and, and the sweat was dropping from his head as if it was blood. Uh, he was agonizing in prayer to the Father and his disciples were asleep and they didn't pray. And he told them they needed to watch and be praying because of temptation that would come in the world. And Lord, uh, I, I pray that uh, uh, once the Holy Spirit came upon those disciples, their whole countenance changed. Their whole life agenda changed. I pray the same for us, Lord. Help us in this last day when the spiritual darkness is creeping upon the church. And uh, Lord, there is great uh, 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 apostasy in our world. Lord, we love you. Again, thank you for this story, the Christmas story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.